Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Lou Doty. I'm a professor in the Department of Education, and I'm the director of ELSA, the Elmhurst Learning and Success Academy, which is an on-campus academic program for young adults with differing abilities. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for Dr. Temple Grandin's talk on autism, helping different kinds of minds solve problems. She will be happy to answer some of your questions after her presentation. If something clicks up, we might be able to talk to it. She'll be able to, you can submit your questions while she's speaking and at the end of her remarks, um, you can type them into the chat or the Q&A um, and she'll answer them. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Elmhurst University, Dr. Troy Van Aken. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, good evening. And I'd also like to welcome you to this Elmhurst University event. Events like these reaffirm our commitment to civic engagement and to offering discussions on some of the most compelling topics of the day. They also celebrate our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which are among our core values and also make up one of the foundational pillars of our 2021 strategic plan. Tonight's event is part of the Roland Quest Lecture Series at Elmhurst University. Established in 1996, the Quest Lecture honors alumnus Roland Quest from the class of 1936, a former McDonnell Douglas engineer who worked on the original space shuttle and also founded the Quest Marine Company. And now back to Professor Doty, who will introduce our fantastic speaker this evening. Thank you. So I'm very honored to introduce Temple Grandin. She's a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. She also is a pioneer in improving the welfare of farm animals, and she's an advocate for autism awareness and understanding. I've had the pleasure of hearing her speak um, one time at a talk for parents in Glen Ellen in 2016 and several conferences throughout the years. Her life and her work has been so influential to convey to future teachers and for our continued assessment and improvements for the ELSA program. Professor Grandin grew up with autism, with speech therapy and specific instruction. She learned to talk. Mentoring by her high school science teacher and her aunt on a ranch in Arizona motivated her to study and pursue a career as a scientist and livestock equipment designer. Dr. Grandin earned her bachelor's degree at Franklin Pierce College in 1970. In 75, she earned her MS in animal science at Arizona State University. And she was awarded her PhD in animal science from the University of Illinois in 1989. She's the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller, Animals in Translation, Using the Mysteries of Autism to Decode Animal Behavior, and another book, Thinking in Pictures, My Life with Autism. Her early life and career were the subject of a feature film, Temple Grandin, which received seven Emmy Awards, the Golden Globe, and a Peabody Award. She has spoken to parents and teachers across the country about her remarkable life and growing up with autism. So please join me in welcoming Temple Grandin. Well, it's great to be here tonight. There are a lot of things to talk about tonight. I was very lucky that I got into a very good early educational intervention program. I can't emphasize enough how important that was. When I was two and a half years old, I had no speech, got into a great speech therapy program, Lots of emphasis with taking turns. You got to teach these kids to take turns. And Miss Reynolds, my speech teacher, uh, knew that. I can't emphasize enough early intervention. Another thing she did, she slowed down when she talked to me. Like she'd hold up a cup and she'd say cup, and then she'd say cup. Puh. She also knew to wait for me to respond because I'm sort of like a slow computer. And maybe we could put my first slide up there. I'm. Um, Okay, hopefully that's going to work. Okay, good. That's working. That's good. Um, one thing I did a lot in the 50s is I got outside, and this is a new book I came out for children called The Outdoor Scientist, because I spent uh, all kinds of time collecting rocks. My sister and I collect rocks. We'd um, 
I'm make daisy chains, I'm doing things outside. We gotta get kids doing more stuff. Today I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and often get asked how to end up working with the cattle industry. I was exposed to it when I was a teenager. We gotta get kids out exposed to a lot more things. I remember going to science museum as a child, going to car factory, a dairy. Um, I think a lot of kids today just aren't seeing enough stuff. And we'll go on to the next slide. And the thing I want to ask is what would happen to some of the top innovators that we had? I've had a long career working on uh, designing equipment for the uh, livestock industry. Uh, my systems are in some of the largest companies. And I worked with a lot of uh, metal workers that were either autistic, ADHD, or autistic. Really brilliant machinery designers. You know, what would happen to those kids today? This worries me. Let's go to the next slide. And let's look at some other things I've observed. I've had a lot of grandparents coming up to me. They find out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. Granddaddy's a NASA space scientist, or he was in special sales, or he was a computer programmer. And he learned to work at a young age. This is a really big problem. I'm seeing a lot of problems with a lot of smart individuals on the spectrum not learning life skills. Things like shopping, I was learning that as a child. I'm seeing teenagers where they've never gone in a store and bought something. You gotta learn these things. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm, I'm kind of a NASA geek. And I'm, I did some really interesting research onto some of the people that were involved in making this mission successful. People that are just now getting credit for it. And we'll go on to the next slide. And I had a very emotional experience there. I am a total geek for these things. We can go on to the next slide. And I got to tour this launch pad. This is about three years ago under construction. And the person who was in charge of this project had Tourette's syndrome. Now this brings up a really important thing about identity. Autism is an important part of who I am. But being a scientist, being a professor, that comes first. Because you find out that the geeks and the misfits and the kids with the labels are building the stuff. And this is now, this is three years ago I visited this. This is not something, you know, 20 years ago. It's now, let's go to the next slide. Now this is one of my most important slides. This is the different kinds of minds. Now when I was in my twenties, I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I did. And if you watch the HBO movie, you can see how I think in pictures. I'm what's called an object visualizer, but I can't do algebra. And I'm worried that a lot of us object visualizers are getting screened out of something like um, doing animation or photography or auto mechanics or some other thing like that because they couldn't pass algebra. That's ridiculous. What you need is the old fashioned math the way it used to be taught. Now, if you're gonna be doing orbital mechanics, yes, you need to have algebra. Um, then you have the autistic person that is the pattern thinker. They're the mathematician. They're running Silicon Valley. They are doing computer programming. These kids often have trouble with reading. In fact, I had some trouble with reading. I didn't learn to read until I was eight. Mother homeschooled me, taught me with phonics. So some kids will be a phonics learner. Some kids will be a sight word learner. And you need to get a book that's actually worth reading, something interesting. Then you have another kind of um, autistic person who's the verbal facts person. Loves history, loves statistics and facts. And the thing about people on the spectrum is good at one thing, terrible at something else. We need to be building up the strength. I used my ability in drawing um, to is the basis of my design business. And my mother always encouraged my drawing when I was a child. And then so-called normal people, they have mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. But autism is a true continuous trait. One is a little bit geeky, become autistic. Now there's no black and white dividing line. Also, they've widened the spectrum to the point where it's really kind of crazy, where you're putting a Fortune 500 uh, head of a company in the same category as somebody that can't dress themselves as epilepsy and other severe medical problems on top of it. Let's go to the next slide. Well, let's look at some mission critical expertise here. Katherine Johnson. Now this is shocking. I did not know about Katherine Johnson until I um, saw the movie Hidden Figures. And she is the uh, black lady that did the mathematics. 
and now is finally getting the recognition she deserves. She's mission critical for NASA. But one good thing happened in her education. When she was a child, they moved her math ahead, let her do high school and college math. Hal Laning, there's very little that's known about this guy. Messy office at MIT, likes to do algebra for play, and he did the equations that made it possible for the lunar lander computer to work. Was he on the spectrum? I don't know. But messy office, that's one thing I know about him. Two, mission critical in the math department. Now we're going to talk about mission critical in my department. Let's go to the next slide. They kept it secret for years that the play suit, that the space suit was made by play cups. And there were several of the best seamstresses that sold it. Their boss was a TV repairman. Yes, the guys couldn't stand the thought of the Playtex living spacesuit, but that's what it is. There were ladies at sewing machines that sewed this, and um, they had to design it so that the astronaut wouldn't be spread eagle in it when it was pressurized. Mission critical. Let's go to the next slide. Now I went and checked out the Mars rover. These are the cameras naked before they're put into the Mars rover. See that hand done wiring there? Somebody did that in a shop. That's not getting enough credit. It's mission critical. Okay, I looked up the little helicopter they have. Yes, I found out it has a smartphone chip in it. It's running on this software and that. But somebody made that thing. You see, you're gonna have the visual thinkers like me that make stuff. And then you're gonna have the mathematical thinkers that get the Mars rover to Mars. Yes, and I looked at all her selfies she's been taking. I saw lots of hand done wiring on that. Let's go to the next slide. And there's the pictures it takes. It was very interesting to find out that the camera company was started by a bunch of geology professors from my old uh, alma mater at Arizona State, and they love their rocks. And their slogan is um, uh, all about imaging, discovery through imaging. Go to the next slide. My grandfather was the co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. And he worked with another person who was probably autistic. And this person came up with the idea for the three little coils, which everybody in aviation thought it was stupid. But my grandfather and a guy named Haig Andronikian tinkered and tinkered and tinkered in the loft over a place where they fixed trains. And they finally got this thing to work. It was in every airplane during World War II. It was a major invention. Not very good business people. It got ripped off. The ripoff was in every plane. That was the flux gate. That's not a nice word in our family. His invention is the flux valve. They're basically the same thing. He did get a nice settlement after the war was over, uh, but my grandfather didn't sue because it was needed for the war effort. We'll go to the next slide. How about Michelangelo? Dropped out of school at age 12. Where would he end up today? Probably playing video games and you know somewhere if they existed but he was exposed to art. All the churches were doing art. He was also exposed to the tools for making the art. Really, really important. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and Steve Jobs bullied in school. He was an artist. That's why your phone's easy to use because an artist designed the interface. The mathematicians had to make the programming work. You see, that's the different minds working together. Visual thinker for the interface, mathematician for the insides. Einstein would definitely land in an autism class today. He had no speech till age three. Now people argue about whether he's autistic, but if he was a kid today, he would definitely be in an early speech therapy class. Let's go to the next slide. Thomas Edison, high school dropout, probably had autism. Yep, you read about him, memorized every street in his town. He also learned to work at an early age. He was selling newspapers on the trains. He was a naughty boy. He managed to burn up the baggage car of a train. That did not make him real popular with the railroad. The next slide. We need to be keeping these classes in the schools. The worst things the schools have done. They've taken out art, sewing, musical instruments, woodworking, theater, welding, auto shop. Another reason for keeping all these classes is to get students exposed to enough stuff so they might know what they might want to do. Now theater, I was not the least bit interested in acting, but I loved making sceneries and costumes. That's something that can become a career. I made costumes for elementary school play and I made them for the high school play too. We did trial by jury and I made cardboard jury boxes. 
nope, I didn't do any of the acting, I just made the sets. But again, that's another career thing. I worked with two people that own big metal fabrication companies saved by the high school welding class. We're actually losing skills right now. Let's go to the next slide. Because people ask me, what would I do uh, to um, fix education? We've got to get those kind of classes back in. Now, how, I get asked by parents, how do I tell what kind of thinker my kid is? Well, they get to be about seven or eight, not three-year-olds. Art ability. That's when my art ability started to show up. I like to make things. Uh, mechanical ability. This is a kid that loves Legos and building things. But some of these kids are growing up and never being exposed to tools. That's ridiculous. I had a student in my class, and they have to do a scale drawing in my class who had never used a ruler in her life recently. And then you have the math thinkers. Well, they like computer programming, but you got to expose them to it. I've had parents who are both computer programmers, had a smart eight-year-old, you know, elementary school kid with an autism label, and they didn't think to expose their kid to computer programming. They kind of got too stuck in the autism box. And then you got the verbal thinkers, they'll love history and facts. You know, they'll know every movie of a certain genre, things like that. And when they grow up, they might be really good at, at sales jobs. There's a big bank that has two um, verbal thinking autistic guys selling specialized financial products. My kind of thinking does animation, photography, and uh, like metalworking, math thinkers, they're running Silicon Valley. And you need the different kinds of minds. They complement each other. We can go on to the next slide. And we've got to be exposing kids to things that can become possible careers. I cannot emphasize that enough. Another thing about careers is half of all good jobs are backdoor. Somebody knows somebody to get them into a job. And this is just some ideas of um, visual thinking jobs. I need to put photography on that slide. That was something I was pretty good at. I um, just saw a new iPhone today. I'm probably going to be getting that. Oh, man, it's taking beautiful pictures. Couldn't believe the depth of field in it. It was just great. Um, engineers. I've had an engineer come up to me about two years ago, and he, um, he uh, discovered he was on the autism spectrum um, after his kid got diagnosed. And some of the verbal thinkers can be very good at specialized retail. Well, for example, selling cars, where they um, um, know every car on the lot walk into a car dealership and just start selling cars. Specialized knowledge. And the kind of social rules you need for that's business social. And that's another reason why granddaddy had a job because in the 50s and 60s, social rules like saying please and thank you were taught in a much more systematic manner. Let's go on to the next slide. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to um, some other scientist. That's another reason for keeping these things in the schools. Let's go to the next slide. When you're weird, what you got to do is sell your work, not yourself. So I'm going to show you some portfolio stuff that I use to sell Cargill. I've designed the front end of all, every Cargill beef plant in North America. You go out and have a steak, you got a very good chance that that animal went through a piece of equipment I designed. And one of the things that motivated me back in the 70s is I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. Also, going into a man's industry, being a woman was a much bigger barrier than autism ever was. Go to the next slide. And that's uh, some of the, more of my drawings. That's from the Dipping Vat project that's shown in the movie. And so an interview for me was lay the drawings out on the table. That's what I did. Show the work. Learn to sell your work. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the, the uh, drawing right there that I sold to Cargill. I sent the head of Cargill, Mr. Fielding, back in the late 80s. This drawing, big fold-out drawing, basically that 30 second wow. Now, why is it say on there you gotta touch to perceive? Because when the industry went from hand drafting to computer drafting in the mid nineties, I started seeing weird mistakes on drawings. Like the center of the circle was not in the center of the circle. They weren't seeing it. Those drawings were made by somebody who had never built anything and had never drawn by hand. Let's go to the next slide. And there's one of the pictures that went in the original portfolio. We'll go to the next slide. We can go through these pretty quickly. Just want to show it off. There's the replica they built for the movie. I love the fact they had all my projects accurate in the movie. I just love that. I geeked out on that. Let's go to the next slide. There's my brochure. You want to just have a really nice portfolio, 30 second while. It's black and white, 70s and 80s. Color printing was too expensive back then. 
go on to the next slide. And that's another uh, uh, photo that went into the packet that went to Cargill. We'll go to the next slide. And there's original black and white uh, pictures of the original dipping vat project was shown in the movie. That's 1976 right there. And we'll go on to the next slide. Now, who builds large food processing plants? I've worked for every major meat company. It's really interesting how the labor is divided up on building factories. And the visual thinker like me designs the plant layout. Also makes what all what I call the clever engineering department. All that really clever, complicated equipment, packaging equipment. Um, think the inside of the copy or the paper feed, things like that makes that. And the mathematical thinkers do things that require more mathematics, boilers, roof trusses, refrigeration systems. And the problem is my kind of minds are not getting replaced. They're playing video games in the basement. We're losing critical skills. Go on to the next slide. 20% of the people I worked with were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I know two people, they were really super autistic, multiple pens, multiple pens. I know three of them. And they designed and built complex equipment. Yeah, and one of the reasons I want to let everybody know about this is that there's a tendency to get kind of, you know, stuck too much in the autism box. I mean, go on to the next slide. Now that's some very brand new equipment that plants about four years old. Everything you see there is imported from a high wage country. We are not making it anymore. We're losing skills because the little shops are not forming to, because what happens on inventing this sort of stuff is little shops in, invent the stuff and then they grow into big shops. Yeah, you ought to look at the video of the inside of an Amazon warehouse. It's really cool. I could really geek out on that. I could, if I was instantly made young today, Oh, I'd like to design the next one. Yeah. And I have seen that kind of path. I've seen it in the meat industry. Come in, get a job on the line, gravitate over to the maintenance department. Next thing, they're fixing stuff. 15 years later, they're in charge of the new plant edition. I have seen people do that. And people on the spectrum do that. Let's go to the next slide. Well, this is the Steve Jobs Theater. I had a real cool visit to Apple. Notice that there's no columns. It's uh, all glass, carbon fiber roof. The glass is from Italy and Germany. The carbon fiber roof is from the Middle East. We're not making it anymore. I screamed that in the middle of that and, and, and it vibrated in a very, very cool way when I did that. We'll go on to the next slide. A Mars landing, Let's who, who did things for that? The fabric was, uh, made in the UK for that parachute. It was sewn in the US, but it was probably made on high-tech looms from Europe. Yeah, there's stuff we're not making anymore. I've gone shopping for that stuff. And, uh, and they have that way that pattern is on there. It actually says dare mighty things. I think that's very, very cool. I just can't believe how clear these pictures are because photography is another thing I like to geek out about. Let's go to the next slide. Visual thinkers, computers, people with autism, we're bottom-up thinkers. Verbal thinkers are top-down, ask a lot of vague questions. Well, how do we do inclusion? Well, let's narrow it down to maybe inclusion in a specific place, how you would do it. Okay, like what kind of supports might a person need in the office? Some people are sensitive to LED lights that flicker. So you, know, you have to get rid of that. Or they need a quiet place to work. Another thing I like to have is very clear guidelines on what I'm supposed to do on a project. What is the outcome? You see, concepts are formed with specific examples. You see, I'm thinking of specific examples of people that did things. I'll tell you one job you don't put a person with autism into, super crazy takeout window with tons of multitasking. That's not going to work. Things I did do not require multitasking. Let's go to the next slide. Here are some tips for working with minds that are different. Do not overload working memory. If I was a computer, I would be, um, I'd, I would be a Intel 286, but I've got lots and lots of memory. Any task that involves sequence, give them a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three, step four. 
give them a pile of checklists. I can't remember long strings of verbal stuff. Also, we need to stretch these kids. I'm saying too much overprotective, not shopping. We got to limit the video game playing and get them out doing a whole lot of things. What kind of things do I like to do? Well, I got a really cool visit to a state-of-the-art processing plant in May. I'm really looking forward to that. You know, that, and I mean, Cheryl and I, uh, my assistant Cheryl buys lots of things from Amazon. And I said, have you ever seen the inside of an Amazon warehouse? And we found the coolest video. She just couldn't believe it. And I said, yeah, there's a lot to it. It's really cool. I'm just thinking, let's say I was a young person today, I would have been attracted to that. And I probably would have, maybe I would, maybe I would have designed the next one because I love problem solving. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the thing we got to be thinking about, and I think we have to think about this really seriously, is what is the ultimate goal of education? Where is a student 10 years after high school? I was designing that dip that's, and this will be the last slide I'll show. And then we're going to open it up for the questions. And I um, look at some of the questions. Favorite thing to do? Well, I like, I need to go see the Godzilla movie. I mean, just for fun, for giggles. Um, one question I get asked all the time is how to deal with the pandemic. And that's been really hard for a lot of people. And what I found works for me is you got to get up, get dressed for work every day, dressed for work by 7.30. Try to do the things that require thinking, like writing and stuff in the morning, but get on a schedule. And I suggested the kids to look up life on the International Space Station because that's what they do. And they do their real serious work in the morning, then they have the midday meal. Everybody has to be at the midday meal. Then you exercise in the afternoon, and then you have time to play. Watch movies, look out the window, take a phone that they somehow hooked up, and call your friends when they're stuck in the Houston traffic and tell them goofy stuff. Because in the beginning, uh, they didn't give them time off. That was a mistake. But um, Scott Kelly, who spent a year on the space station, said having a schedule is really important. You know, you have some structure. Can you have traits? One person asked, can you have traits in more than one category? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, you definitely can. You definitely can. Well, I had to stop this antivirus thing was trying to download. I had to stop that. Certainly, we should have some more questions. Let's see what's uh, in the chat. Um, what would I advise an eight-year-old in terms of friendship? That's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I got friends through shared interests. That's another reason for doing lots of different things. When I was in high school and I got bullied and I got teased in school, I had friends in horseback riding friends in model rockets and friends in electronics. For an eight-year-old, it might be um, uh, art class. It could be band. It could be music. It could be a lot of different things. It could be a chess club. It could be computer programming club. You know, kids do robotics. I would do the mechanical part and the mathematicians can do the programming. And friends through shared interests. One enterprising teacher started a Star Wars club and then the autistic kid got some friends friends who shared answers. When do you use the checklist? Any task, you know, let's say how to unjam the copier. Step one, step two, step three, step, write it down. How to clean the ice cream machine at McDonald's. Step one, step two, step three, step four. Okay, that's your tear down steps and then your cleaning steps and then your reassemble it steps. Then you might want to look up pilot's checklist. And they're very interesting how they're put together. Uh, you have a simple checklist for a little tiny airplane, but then you have, I, got, I found the checklist for the Dreamliner. It had a hundred items on it. You don't throw that at the pilot. You chunk it. It's like pre-taxi, pre-takeoff. There might be five or six things in each one of those chunks in the different parts of the flight. It's not optional for pilots. What helped me become verbal? Uh, well, I had a lot of speech therapy when I was a child. And my speech came in slowly, a few stressed words at a time. And then there's other kids, 
that um, uh, they don't hear clearly, even though they're not deaf. When the grown-ups talk fast, when they did gibberish, and when they talk slowly, I could understand. What's the most important thing to teach three-year-olds? Well, if they're not talking, I want to get them talking. And the other thing is basic skills, dressing, brushing their teeth, uh, turn-taking games, how to wait and take turns, how to wait and take turns. Now, I've got a question there from Caitlin on learning styles. I think this is really going to affect careers that people are going to pick out. Uh, and I found it certainly affects how the jobs get divided up when people get into a situation where you can gravitate towards different things. I'm, I'm very concerned about draconian algebra requirements because you're screening. I've never passed an algebra class. I managed to get out of it. Um, it wasn't required in 67. Well, the course I took in 67 when I was a freshman was finite math, probability, matrices, and statistics. But we're screening a lot of, of kids out on, um, you know, okay, veterinary technician, for example, dosing of drugs, that has to be accurate. That's not algebra, that's old fashioned arithmetic, the way it used to be taught. Yeah, that they have to be able to do in their sleep. Um, the, uh, okay, someone asked about ABA. I, there was some old, really awful ABA that some advocates had forced on them. They had a good reason to hate it. They were driven into sensory overload. That's completely bad. I, a thing I think that, that parents have to look at, okay, you've got a three-year-old, is he making progress? And I'm gonna call progress speech, better turn-taking, learning skills, more engaged. A good teacher knows just how hard to push without causing sensory overload, just how to stretch. And, and if it's a really good teacher, the kid's gonna like going to therapy. You know, the kid, if the kid screams, doesn't want to go to therapy, probably getting pushed into, um, into sensory overload. Um, some of the fun stuff I remember, early memories, a lot of fun stuff, you know, coasting on toboggan in the snow, making a snowman. Um, my sister and I had a great time with the rock collection that I talk about in the Outdoor Scientist book. Um, we had a great time with that. But mother... Deborah's asking about how did mother stretch me? She'd always give me a choice. And when I was 15, I had the opportunity to go to my aunt's ranch. She gave me a choice. I could go for a week or I'd go all summer. Not going was one of the choices. But I always give them some sense of control so that there's some choice. Um, now, the thing with medications is way too many drugs given out to little kids. Now, in my Way I See It book right here, um, I've it's now only two years old, so still pretty current. Um, I talk about medications, and then in, in Thinking and Pictures, I talk about my experiences with anxiety. And, and I've been on antidepressants since uh, 1980, since my early 30s. And it stopped these horrible panic attacks that were pulling, ripping me apart. Um, but there's way too many drugs given out to little kids, way too many. And the younger the kid is, the more careful you should be about medications. And let's look at other things to maybe help with behavior, like exercise, for example. Mother would say, go out and run the energy out of you. Um, doing some other calming things, a weighted blanket, or you know, a, you know, but you know, things, a lot of other things that you could do. Um, it's, you know, people always want the quick fix. I found even on stuff with cattle management. They want the thing more than they want the management. Oh, let's buy the brand new piece of equipment. And it's gonna manage itself. Well, I can tell you that doesn't work. I made the common engineering mistake that young engineers make. And that is um, thinking I could build a self-managing cattle handling system. That is nonsense. It's just like in a school, you can't replace teachers with technology. Um, um, earlier questions, um, Julie had put in, 16 year old is interested in getting his first job working at a heritage farm nearby. He would be working farmers markets, animal care, general public facing services like answering questions. Any advice on interviewing? Skip it. I know my only interviews I ever did was as a journalist, I'd interview people. And when I went to sell jobs, it was lay the drawings out on the table. You see, I had a, 
I had a job where I had stuff I could show off. I could show off drawings, photos. Let's say the person's a programmer. Then you can have code that you can show off to show work. I think we need to be working on a lot more back doors where, where you get in and say, well, just try me for two weeks. I'll show you what I can do. Then there's another one. My son is 11. He pushes back and tantrums when I try to sign him up for anything at all, even things he seems to be interested in. Any tips on how to push past this? So he isn't sitting in the basement? Yeah, you're going to sign up for something, but you'll have a choice. Give him two or three choices. Stuff you think he might like, but you're going to go to one of them. Good. In other words, give him some control of their environment. And then there's one from Lauren. How can companies do a better job of changing their recruitment process to include those with different abilities? Well, they need to do that. And I've done a lot of talks with big corporations and, and uh, they need the different kinds of thinkers. Uh, we're losing the ability to build factories and things. And you see, there's a whole world of industrial stuff you know, on livestock stuff that I've worked on. And I like to talk about it because I'm trying to like bust you out of that autism box. And you go, I've been out to Silicon Valley. I've given talks at every major tech company. And the thing that's interesting is they avoid the labels. I, you see, I did another book you might be interested in, Different Not Less. I was the editor of this book. And it's 18 people diagnosed on the spectrum later in life, all at jobs. But where the label really helped them was on their relationships. Then they understood why they weren't getting along with their life. You know, that was, um, is uh, really important. Well, somebody wrote on here, Sierra wrote on here, some people need medication for depression. Yes, there's a big difference. I was a young adult when I went on medication. I've been on medication for 40 years, it saved me. And there's some people as adults that need to be on medication the rest of their life. But the thing I really object to is just giving kids tons of meds. I have on, oh, it is bad. I have been to meetings where like a seven-year-old is on five or six different drugs. And when I ask the parent about it, I find out no thought went into it. In other words, you threw another tantrum, so they threw another drug at it. And they might, and they might put them on three things at once so you don't even know what's working. That's not... Um, but I would agree that there are definitely some people that need medication. And, and I, I don't know if I'd be here now without the medication because my health when I was in my early 30s was coming apart. Colitis, that's why I was eating all this yogurt and jello. I, my health was completely falling apart. And then when I went on the medication, I, it helped me. And then I've also know people that have um, taken a little Prozac or something like that for anxiety. I worked with some of these people and it, it got them off of drugs and alcohol. And, and I've seen people that were stable on meds go off of them and it'd be a complete mess. No, there's definitely a place for meds. Careful, conservative use of meds and meds you tolerate well too. You know, a person needs has a choice of which meds, but then once you get nice and stable, I'm, um, it's, uh, I'm trying to, no, because I've been taking medication, one medication for 40 years. I don't know what happened to me if the factory stops making them. There's some other things I can substitute. Uh, but I don't think I'd be here now without that medication. And if you want to read about my experience, personal experiences with meds, it's in this book, Thinking and Pictures. And I really recommend, you know, reading it. I describe what it was like having these horrendous panic attacks. And someone, now, Caitlin's asking about how, think about in pictures. Everything I think about is in a picture. So I could design a piece of equipment, I see it. And then my first work with cattle, I looked at what are the cattle seeing? Okay, there's a coat on the fence. It made the cattle stop. Other people weren't seeing that. When I was in my 20s, I didn't know I thought differently. I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know that I had a different kind of thinking. And animals live in a sensory-based world. I found this great paper on multiple stored views in ants. And they go out and they forage. They turn around and snap a picture of a landmark as they go. And then when they come back, they match the pictures. You know, it's, uh, and then the mathematical mind thinks in patterns. 
and then the, what, it was a shock to me when I, when I found out in my late 30s that there were other people that didn't think in pictures at all. And if I say to you, think about a church steeple, I see specific ones, or if I ask a visual thinker, think about church steeples, they start naming them off. But I was shocked the day that I asked the speech therapist about church steeples, and all she saw was that. That's all. I was shocked. That's when I realized other people don't think the same way I do. Now there's been research where I talk about the object visualizer and then the mathematical visual spatial person. There's research that backs that up. And that's in my book, The Autistic Brain. This came out in 2013, but there's been more research since then that backed it up. Use keywords, object visualizer, for my kind of mind, visual spatial for the math mind. Those are the words you have to use to find these articles on, on the internet, on the scientific databases. Somebody asked about, can you talk a little bit about your experience with the squeeze machine and how it came about? Yeah. Um, well, I was having these horrible panic attacks when I was a teenager and I watched cattle going in the squeeze shoot for the vaccinations and I go in this thing with two panels and press against the cattle. So I went and tried it. And I found it calmed down my nerves. They, um, somebody, this is a really interesting question from Diane. How can people who don't have these perspectives, pictures, math, or verbal, share their perspective? Uh, I'd be very interested to find out from Diane, okay, because I'm talking about a verbal thinker who thinks of words, a more mathematical mind, or the picture mind. If she's not one of those, then I'd like to learn more about how she thinks. That might be very interesting. Uh, now, one mistake I made in the beginning, a long time ago, is I thought everybody with autism thought in pictures, and that's wrong. They don't all think in pictures. But so far, I've found this visual thinkers, this math thinkers, and this word thinkers, or verbal thinkers, and then there's mixtures. Somebody over in the chat put, what is your opinion on person first versus identity first language? I'll use whatever you want. That's sort of, um, if it, I'll use what they tell me to use. See, to me, they, my primary identity is a scientist. Autism is a very important part of who I am. I wouldn't want to snap my fingers and have it go away. I like the logical way I think. But scientist comes first. It's um, some of the funnest stuff I've ever done in my whole life was like, you know, figuring stuff out. Or we were out somewhere and we were building stuff, figuring out how to do it. That's what turns me on. And it makes me super happy when I'm, I'm you know, I you know, do something that helps somebody out. Oh, and I want to mention uh, some good resources for people that remain nonverbal. There's some very good books. There's Tito Makapade, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? Types completely independently. And he describes not being able to control movement and sensory scrambling. There's also um, The uh, Reason I Jump and the sequel to The Reason I Jump, which is actually a better book than the first one. Again, totally independent typing. There's a new book that's going to be coming out this summer. I can find it in my pile of books here. I got sent a review copy of this book right here. Um, I have been buried under years of dust. It will come out this summer. And it's a person who's completely nonverbal, types independently. And, and uh, yeah, don't underestimate them. And, and sometimes something as simple as a text messaging program on a tablet will work because the print appears next to the keyboard. That's what makes it work. And there's no attention shift. Can't attention shift, like my keyboard's way down here, and then that print appears up there, I can't attention shift. Okay, on. Um, see, now the thing is, if, well, here's a question about self-management. Well, you see, I, I wanna find out, I have to be able to visualize what exactly is the problem. See, self-management is really vague. I don't know what that is. You see, I got to, 
the thing I have found on troubleshooting, I don't care if it's horse behavior, dog behavior, they'll go, well, my horse is crazy. Well, well I don't know, what's your horse do? I can't answer that, it's too vague. I gotta ask more questions to find out, well, maybe he only threw a fit when you put him in the cross ties. See, I gotta know that. Okay, so I need to find out where the problem is. Uh, one thing that can be a big issue for a lot of uh, meltdowns is sensory overload. And it's like it's hard for some people to imagine that a sound that doesn't bother you might be like a dentist drill in the ear. Now there's some kids where if you let them initiate the dreaded sound, something like a vacuum cleaner or a hairdryer, where they turn it on and control it. Well, here, this is a very interesting perspective here from Diane uh, Mor Morina. Um, one of the things that really helped me was learning about that other people think differently. And I've learned more and more about that. And then you can figure out how to work with somebody who thinks differently. Yep, sensory issues can be a big problem. Sensory issues are real. And as far as I'm concerned, they need to be the number one area of research. They can be extremely debilitating, where you know a lot of social environments are really loud. I can't hear in a noisy restaurant. I, I have some auditory processing problem. That makes the conversation boring if I can't hear it. You know, someone said putting a dog in a crate of horse in the stall. Well, it seemed that what helps with the squeezing machine is actually pressure. Be more like a weighted blanket or um, a weighted vest. Deep pressure is calming. That's, uh, but it doesn't work for everybody. You see, this is one of the problems that some of the research has been done is they just use the autism label to assign subjects to treatment. You need to say, okay, is this person light sensitive? Is this person a pressure seeker? Who happens to like pressure because it doesn't work for everybody. Sarah put an interesting one in the chat. You said you like the way you think and wouldn't get rid of your autism. How do we get others who see autism as a barrier or a disability to realize that people with autism can be powerful thinkers and problem solvers? Well, we wouldn't even have this computer without people with autism. You see, a brain can be more cognitive or a brain can be more social emotional. Well, half the population be more maybe towards the thinking side. And then as you get more and more less emotional, you tend to get more autistic. Depends upon how you allocate the resources in the brain. And, and uh, you know, I always said it was probably someone on the spectrum who made the first stone spear, not the social yakety yaks around the campfire. No, I'm saying that seriously. You see, in the mild forms, it's just a personality variant in the mild forms. The other thing is interesting, when you look at the brain research, and I've looked at that, there's this wonderful paper, it's called Genomic Trade-Offs. Are, uh, is genomic trade-offs, are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? Because the same cells that make the brain big, also, I mean, not the same genetics, excuse me, same genetic code that tells the brain how to grow big, also a risk um, code for autism and schizophrenia. And they're actually opposite conditions developmentally. Autism, you get extra circuits, maybe in the art department or the math department, and then um, leave out some social stuff. Schizophrenia, the network's skimpy and, and comes apart, but it's all brain development. It's a true continuous trait. It isn't like you know, some other conditions where you've either got COVID or you don't. You see, that's... Uh, um, I think uh, here's a good thing from Ryan. I think some of these companies should judge the applicant by putting them in the environment and trying them out for a few weeks. The other thing I think we need to be doing is, is working with uh, people to develop portfolios because that's how I sold jobs. And then after I built a job, I wrote about it in the cattle magazines. And I, and I put the drawings and stuff in there. And I don't think it should just be based on an interview because a really good techie's not gonna interview that well. If I wanna hire a machinery designer, I don't really care about his interviewing skills, show me his work. 
You see, and the thing about a lot, you know, okay, for visual thinkers, photography, animation, those would be examples of work. Or code, show off code, show off an app you made, show off stuff that you, you did, or a robot you built, or The other thing is we've got to get people out exposed to more stuff because as a bottom-up thinker, you got to fill my database with information because I use the information that's in the database to look at the future. That's why, you know, get out and do things. Now, the other problem is the pandemic is a really uh, uh, may a big problem. Okay, mask wearing, let's practice at home. There's lots of choices. Lots and lots of choices and give them choices. And where I'm at home, I found these. Our university gave out these really nice soft ones. I'll show it to you. Um, that's, it's all tangled up in my car keys, but they're just, uh, it's very soft uh, jersey material. And it's made by something called Bayside 100% cotton. And uh, it's more, I think it's more comfortable than some of the other masks. But there's a lot of choices. And, and you just have to get used to it. And don't have scratchy ones. The other thing I'd recommend is wash it first because I'm allergic to a lot of the sizing that's in clothing. So all my underwear I wash before I wear it. And I would do the same thing with the mask. You know, advise how to deal with overstimulation. Well, this is where, where uh, you know, the child needs to have a signal and take a break and get away from some of that stimulation. How do you start teaching vocational skills? Well, I grew up using tools. Kids aren't doing enough stuff. That's another reason why I did this book, Calling All Minds, because when I was about seven, I spent hours on little kite experiments, experimenting, experimenting, and experimenting to get my little kites to work. And that, and I, and I think this is gonna solve some of the problem with kids being so afraid of making mistakes. We don't, we don't do enough physical things. I had a teacher, I showed a paper snowflake and I had a teacher say, what's gonna happen to the kid's self-esteem if the snowflake falls apart? I said, well, you get another piece of paper and you try again. Then maybe you look it up on YouTube. You know, they, I think some of this problems with fear of mistakes is because they're not doing enough physical things. Um, well, and you have to, um, I had some good mentors. I had a great third grade teacher, great speech teacher. My mother always was pushing me. I had a fantastic science teacher where he showed me that studying was a path to a goal. They also were some good people in the industry. There were people that bad were bad, but there was a good person named Jim, the contractor starting a little tiny construction company. And he'd seen my drawings and he seeked me out. He was a Marine Corps captain. And in that little tiny construction company that built that black and white dip vat you saw, uh, he put together a rather diverse team, this Marine Corps captain. And for 10 years, I did jobs with him. But he'd seen my drawings and he was an important mentor getting my business started, he helped me set up my corporation. He just did all kinds of things. See, this is where I think it's important that, you know, uh, portfolios are just so important. That's how I sold drugs. Show the drawings off. It's what I did. You know, and these sensory issues, it, you know, for some people, it's really bad. And there's a paper that, that it's evidence-based for kids up to age 10. It's called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. And what you basically do is you stimulate two senses at the same time, like maybe smell aromatherapy, touch a cold water glass. And I, and it seems, I think it helps on desensitizing. How did I write all the books? Um, I, uh, word, words narrate the pictures. That's how I write them. Now I have to mention some of my books I did have co-writers, but then the books that I did well, in the livestock, um, my livestock stuff is, you want to see some of my writing that's not with a, with a co-writer, you can go on grandon.com, also on templegrandon.com. That's all stuff I wrote. Thinking in Pictures, there's no co-writer on that book. Uh, 
and my professional stuff on well if I had might have a student worked on that but if the art if it's a professional article just my name on it I wrote it no I basically I you know I narrate the I narrate the pictures but the problem with being a visual thinker is I'm an associational thinker and I ramble around. Now we're working on another book right now on visual thinking. You just send it into the editor. I hope she's going to like it. I'm working with a great uh, verbal thinker, Betsy Lerner, and we're trying to get this book so the visual thinkers can relate to it better. So we're trying to do right now because I'm worried our visual thinkers are getting screened out and we need them. We've got infrastructure falling apart, electric grids falling apart. Ugh, as a visual thinker, I look at some of that equipment and I'm like, oh. Ugh. So we're starting to run out of yeah, time. Is there one, last last one last question you could answer up there? Yep, okay, let's see. Oh, sensory issue with clothing. You know, there are some people where where there's been some improvement in sensory uh, issues with a very, very low dose of risperidol, and I mean a micro dose, and that's written up in the way I see it. But the uh, sensory issues, as far as I'm concerned, top area for research. They're extremely debilitating, and now my sensory issues now are more nuisances. And I think the antidepressants that I'm on have calmed it down some. Well, I am so thankful we had this opportunity to talk with you and, and people could put some of their thoughts in there. I'm sure they could still email you if they still had questions um, through your website. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts. With well, I want to address Jessica's question. Her daughter doesn't want friends. Well, the thing to do is look at friends who shared interest. Okay, what does this daughter like to do? That's where she could have a friend. And uh, you know, this thinking and now the way this way I see it, book right here, this is not co-written. The way I see it, and thinking and pictures do not have co-writers. Thinking of uh, the way I see it, it's got a whole lot of little short articles. I wrote those myself. They're not co-written. Well, we've got to start. I'm um, also trying to introduce you to a world of business and uh, you know someone had said to me when I was uh, in high school I'd be doing working in the cattle industry I would have said what but I got exposed to it when I was 15. No we've got to and some of the most fun stuff I had most fun stuff I ever did in my life and some of the most stressful stuff I ever did in my life was figuring out how to build stuff and make it work. Of advice about siblings. Um, I had a I had three siblings and a sister a year and a half younger. And my mother's given talks and said, you know, you've got to make sure the siblings get quality time. That sometimes my sister got kind of left out, and that was not good. Um, but I hope I've given you some ideas. And I had a lot of ideas. Thank you so much. Um, And the thing that was been an interesting journey for me is learning how differently I think. Okay, like right now working on the new book with Betsy and she's a hyper verbal learner, hyper. Like I like to look at data on tables. She hates tables, hates them. And she says, my eyes just glaze over. I sent her a table, Blech. she says, we're not using that. But that, but the thing is, is that there's, but when the two kinds of minds work together, we can really do some really good stuff, but you recognize the strength of each kind of mind. I think that whole idea you know, that's, um, yeah. and for me, I, you know, I'm one of the people that's, I don't know where I'd be if I hadn't taken the medication. I sometimes look at that little bottle and I go better living through chemistry. I've been on it for 40 years. That's how long I've been on it. I, I don't think I'd be here because I think my health would have been completely wrecked. Well, again, the light has cleared up when I went on the medication. We are right at 8 o'clock. Oh, it, it, it's actually disipramine 
and everything is explained in detail and thinking and pictures. And the mistake made with antidepressants, too high a dose. You'll get insomnia and agitation, you won't be able to sleep. The mistake doctors make is given too high a dose. It's all explained, it's explained in here. And then the personal experiences in thinking and pictures and it's all explained. And even though that book's a bit old now, it's still accurate. Stuff hasn't changed, hasn't changed. But the big mistake they make is doing just great on the low dose and they give them a higher dose and it's horrible. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. No, the, the medication was essential. Uh, but I'm appalled at a six-year-olds on seven things. And when I talked to the parents, no thought had gone into it. They just threw drugs at them. No, that's not okay. And that just making a zombie out of them. Well, it was great to be here. And Thank you uh, so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming, joining us. Well, there's a, you know, the thing is, we got to, yeah, well, I'm going to be going on a trip tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. And I just hope it doesn't I'm going to drive to the airport in snow, but I'm doing an autism meeting and I'm doing a livestock talk. And I, oh, we got another message there. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to my second trip in a year. I was 95, 85% on the road and then boom, middle of March, got home. No more trips. <laughs> well, I guess we can stop the recording now, Chris. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. And it was great uh, talking to everybody. And hope I got some people to, maybe I'll end up with what Stephen Hawking said about disability. Right before he died, he told the New York Times, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. He could do math in his head well, very well. Yeah. That's what he concentrated on. Okay, okay. well, I guess I'm going to leave the meeting. And yeah. uh, thank you. And that's what Stephen Hawking, you know, someone, uh, I was looking up stuff on Stephen Hawking right when he died, and I found that quote that was in the New York Times. I've got to make sure I credit the New York Times too.